Hey folks, it's me again, a locked out NHL fan, with an updated message for both the National Hockey League and the National Hockey League Players Association. And, most importantly, for you, the fans. We've been through a lot together these last four months. Uh, we've been through negotiation after negotiation. We've been through things putting being put on the table and things being taken off the table. And we've been through lovey-dovey times when we thought the lockout was about to come to an end. We've been through... Uh, Dresden firebombings where it doesn't look like they're ever going to get together to talk again. But most importantly, we have been through what feels like 8,000 days of TSN's uh, continuing coverage of the lockout, even when absolutely nothing happens. So this is my updated video for you guys. Uh, for the fans, of course for the NHL, for the National Hockey League Players Association as well. I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Let's get right to the press conference. I would first like to take the opportunity to uh, thank the members of the media who are in attendance today. Uh, I graciously appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy days uh, reporting on when Gary Bettman goes to the bathroom or Don Fear scratches his ass, and for the hard work you put into superimposing your so-called analysis on these banalities in an attempt to keep people watching your television programming. I'm here tonight to once again directly address the major players in the continued negotiations between the National Hockey League owners led by Commissioner Bettman and the NHL Players Association led by Mr. Fear. Uh, I have some questions that uh, desperately require attention from these men, and I hope that my position, as well as the position of the lion's share of hockey fans for whom I am speaking, will be further clarified at the conclusion of this press conference. There will, of course, be a question period when the press conference has ended. I would like to begin by directly addressing Mr. Fear. Uh, Don, can I call you Don? Okay. For you, I have only one primary question. Where is it? Where are you? Where are you? Ah, yes. What the fuck were you thinking? Uh, what could have possibly been going through your snow white skull when you decided to take the job as NHLPA executive director? More to the point, what could have possibly been going through the NHLPA voters' concussion ridden skulls when they vo voted this scowly jowly grandpa as their executive director? To give you a little background on Mr. Fear that he is surely unhappy to have put out in public, Fear was born and raised and educated in rural Missouri, graduating with a degree in law from the Kansas City School of Law at Missouri University. High prestige. It is, after all, the 79th ranked law school just in the United States. Uh, just behind Tennessee and Louisiana, and ranking slightly ahead of Oklahoma and Catholic University in New York. Fear was, by all accounts, a coffee boy during a Major League Baseball arbitration case in the late 70s, and was hired inexplicably by Marvin Miller, one man responsible for modern-day free agency, in 1977 to serve as general counsel for the Major League Baseball Players Association. At this point, there's no indication whatsoever that Mr. Fear is, for lack of a better term, a baseball guy, or had ever played or even watched a game of baseball. However, Fear had some accomplishments as general counsel and eventually executive director of the MLBPA, including forcing MLB owners to, play p to pay players pardon me, somewhere in the neighborhood of $280 million in collusive damages in the mid to late 80s. He was instrumental in the blocking of replacement players during the 1994-1995 MLB work stoppage, aiding, of course, in costing baseball fans a season that year. Fear was eventually replaced as MLBPA executive director in 2009 by a guy named Wiener, a career that closed as it opened, surrounded by dicks. Flash forward to December 18th, 2010. The NHLPA, still apparently butthurt over the acceptance of a salary cap in the previous collective bargaining negotiations five years prior, 
and understanding that that CBA was coming to an end in short order, turn in their haste to a man who, at that point, had been involved in seven contract negotiations, five of which resulted in work stoppages, those five being five consecutive negotiations and hired Don Fear officially as their new executive director, virtually guaranteeing the war of attrition that we now enjoy as hockey fans. Folks, Don Fear is the only man in history to be directly involved as executive director in work stoppages in two professional sports. He is not a hockey guy. There is, again, no reason to believe that he had ever watched a game of hockey prior to joining up with the NHLPA in 2009. He is a lawyer and nothing more. He is stubborn. He is caustic. He often looks like someone pissed in his cereal that morning. He routinely brings his little brother along to negotiations so his mom doesn't have to watch him during her afternoon soap operas. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Fear is a complete joke. But, Mr. Fear is certainly not the only clown in this frustrating cavalcade. Let us now take a look at Mr. Gary Bettman's work history. Gary Bettman, slightly less popular than polio in the most recent straw polls, is a Queens, New York product who, like Fear, has his major background in law, obtaining a Juris Doctorate from NYU Law in the late 70s. Also, like Fear, Bettman worked professionally in a sport other than hockey before joining the NHL Brass, serving in the marketing and legal departments in the NBA, eventually becoming the league's third-in-command at Senior Vice President and General Counsel. Bettman was chiefly responsible for the soft salary cap system that the NBA continues to use today. From there, Bettman was immediately ushered into the newly crowned role of NHL Commissioner. The NHL, who had operated perfectly fine under a president until Bettman was hired in 1993, was looking for Gary to primarily aid in the league's expansion into the U.S. and in the owner's own words, in ending labor unrest. Let's let that last phrase bounce around in our heads for a minute. To aid in ending labor unrest. Mr. Bettman's results in these aspects have been mixed at best, and a complete failure at worst. While it's true that under his reign as commissioner, the league's revenues have skyrocketed almost tenfold, and successful franchises have been formed in non-traditional hockey markets, such as Anaheim, Dallas, and Colorado. Many of the resulting franchises in this American expansion, the Florida Panthers, the Columbus Blue Jackets, the Carolina, whatever they're called, Hurricanes, and the Atlanta Thrashers, rest in peace, have yet to see any real tangible successes, aside from a single Stanley Cup victory for Carolina, who, despite this, still suffer from major financial hardships and fan apathy. The latter of those teams, Atlanta, ultimately collapsed in on itself like a neutron star and had to be moved back to a viable and hockey-hungry market, Winnipeg. Despite being smart enough to see that many of these newly minted American franchises suffer from the same problems as Atlanta prior to its collapse, Mr. Bettman has, in particular, gone out of his way to maintain the franchise in Phoenix after it incurred hundreds of million dollars in debt, filed for bankruptcy, and is now only kept afloat on the backs of the League, who are the primary owners, and the city of Glendale, Arizona, who has committed $50 million in taxpayer money in the last two years to keep that franchise in Phoenix. Mr. Bettman also directly aborted a potential deal to move the Nashville franchise to Hamilton, Ontario, when Nashville was badly struggling. Now, luckily for Mr. Bettman and for the Nashville franchise, they have turned around their on-ice product and, as such, now appear to be a viable and successful franchise once more. When it's on the ice. Mr. Bettman has also been a focal point in what has now become three major work stoppages during his tenure. That's three negotiations, 
three consecutive stoppages between 1993 and 2012. The NHL has the dubious distinction of being the only professional sports league in North America to cancel an entire season due to labor relations strife. For these services, both good and bad, Mr. Bettman receives a salary in excess of $7 million per season. Folks, Gary Bettman is also a joke. He is incessantly booed at every opportunity by the people who inadvertently pay his enormous salary, not because we silently or vocally consent to the job that he's done, but because we love and support the game that he unfortunately represents. Gary, when the fans see you come out onto the ice after a team has finally done it, won the most prestigious and most difficult to win trophy in professional sports and you are booed out of that building that's got to tell you something and I know you sit back and you say well it's good to know that the fans have opinions and that when I'll, I'll start getting worried when I come out and nobody does anything be worried now you jackass people hate you because of what you've done to the sport have you made it grow absolutely but you've also fucked with us three times now and we're absolutely sick of it and we're sick of you my, ladies and gentlemen my apologies. During the process of my Wikipedia research for this press conference, I've come to a few conclusions about these two men. While coming from similar educational backgrounds, neither man comes off to me as, again, a hockey guy, for lack of a better term. Uh, Bettman comes closer with his New York upbringing, but something tells me that Queens is not exactly a hockey mecca. Uh, these two men, for their differences, are, are also very similar in their approach. Uh, they're stubborn, bullheaded, I'm not going to take any answer but the one that I want to hear approach. And are very similarly, extremely quick to point the finger at the other side of the negotiating table in true lawyer fashion and blame the other side for a lack of progress, rather than take any kind of responsibility, really, tangibly, on their own shoulders, it's just much easier to point at the other side and blame them. And the problem is, the little puppets on each side, those being the team owners and the players, have all caught this too. Because any time they get on, especially the fucking players, any time they get on camera, it's like, well, you know, we've been willing to negotiate this whole time, but, you know, the players, oh my god, my head hurts so much from my concussion. Uh, any time, any time that, uh, that uh, we were, I mean, we've never left the table. We're, we're still here, and uh, the league is the one that did this, and the league is the one that pulled away. And just shut up. Just don't talk about it anymore. If you're asked any questions about the lockout, just don't answer them. Just don't. You're not helping yourself, and you're not helping the process. So please, for the love of God, just shut up. They are both excellent at standing in front of a microphone and feigning compassion, emotion, and empathy for the fans. They both claim to want to negotiate in good faith with each other, despite the fact that neither side has shown any willingness to negotiate towards what the other side claims are their major issues. They would rather dance around the bush and hope that the other side is the first one to fall apart. Both men are more concerned with the public relations battle than the negotiations themselves, and on that level, I have a very personal message to both men. You're both fucking losing! The cold hard truth is, hockey fans either hate you both, or you've both become such a bad running joke that neither of you are taken seriously anymore. And you can sit back and say, well, everyone has an opinion, but we know we're doing what we have to do. You're not doing what you have to do. What you have to do is save the season, not win a PR battle, and not beat the other guy. The final and primary conclusion, which I have come to during these proceedings and during my research, is that Mr. Bettman and Mr. Fear have only two options for successfully completing these negotiations. 
The first option is to just have sex and get it over with already. Because, quite frankly, when you have two men who are such narcissists and who suffer from such extreme self-love as Gary Bettman and Don Fear, you cannot help but... Look at the other guy. If you're Gary Bettman, you can't help but look at Donald Fear and vice versa, Don Fear looking at Gary Bettman, and just get a raging heart on. Because here's a man who loves himself as much as I love myself. So, Mr. Bettman, my suggestion to you is to invite Mr. Fear up to your hotel room, dim the lights, put some wine on ice, crank up the Barry White, and engage in some extreme negotiation sessions so that you can get back to the business of finding a fair and equitable deal for both sides. Now both of you can take turns pitching and catching so neither side has to feel like they're being taken advantage of or like they've lost the PR battle between the sheets. If that is somehow unsatisfactory to you, then really you only have one other option if you really, actually, legitimately want to have a season this year. Mr. Bettman and Mr. Fear, you need to remove yourselves from the proceedings entirely. No matter what you say to spin the story, it is clear to hockey fans that the closest these proceedings have come to finding a deal is when neither of you were involved. When it was moderate owners and moderate players coming together, searching out a deal that works for both sides. Was it perfect? No. But it is as close as we have come since you were originally locked out in September to actually finding a deal. As soon as one or both of you were put back into the process, it was Don Fear coming out and announcing that a deal was made to the world. And then Gary Bettman came out five minutes later and was like, everything you guys just negotiated is off the table. Go fuck yourself. That was all in a span of about 15 minutes. Gary and Don, you are the problem. I implore you to remove yourself henceforth from every negotiation between the NHL and the NHLPA and allow those with fewer agendas against the other guy and vendettas against the other guy to make a deal and save this league any further embarrassment. And to the owners and the players, I don't let you off the hook in this either. I implore you, you know what, I demand you to stop sipping the Kool-Aid of your leaders and demanding that these two powder kegs, these two guys who are clearly the reason that we're not playing hockey right now, that you demand that both of them leave these proceedings and stop involving themselves in the process of deciding your futures. My closing statement. Mr. Bettman, Mr. Fear, owners, players, we want our game back. We didn't do anything to lose it. We want your game back. In my previous statement, I said that you were all to blame for where we were at that time, and to that I hold true. Back at that time, every single one of you were to blame for the fact that we were going to be going through another lockout, another work stoppage. But as far as for who's to blame for the fact that we're still here, four months later, but feels like absolutely no closer at all to a deal, it's two names, Bettman and Fear. In a game of chess, sometimes you have to sacrifice your queen in order to win the game. And in this process, there are no bigger queens than Gary Bettman and Don Fear. Now, are there any questions? Anyone? Anybody? You, you in the back? No questions? I made a more coherent and cogent point in 15 minutes than anyone in this whole process has made in four months? Hmm. Thank you for your time. 
I'm a locked out NHL fan, and I cannot wait for the World Juniors and the bomb ass Spengler Cup coming up next week. Both tournaments full of NHL players who should be playing in the NHL right now. Thank you for your time.